And welcome to the final episode of our election debates program. Tonight, Sunday Live Battlegrounds comes to you live from the IEC's Election Results Operations Center here in Tswane. My name is Peter Ndoro. Welcome. Now, in the run-up to this year's municipal elections, political parties have shared with us their manifestos. They've told us what is working and what's broken in their municipalities. Well, South Africans will, on the 3rd of August, make their mark, and tonight... We we'll bring you experts on all things municipal elections and governance. And uh, you can be part of this conversation. You can tweet us using the hashtag, hashtag SABC elections. We certainly look forward to hearing what your thoughts are, especially with the elections that are coming up and affect you so closely. Now, it's been a very busy electioneering season, and the IC has had to uh, contend with multiple challenges leading up to the polls. Starting from tomorrow with the special votes, all the hard work has led up to this very moment in time. Now, our first guest tonight is the IEC's Deputy Chair, Mr. Terry Tsilani. Terry, thank you very much for joining us. I know that uh, in the last few weeks, you probably haven't got much sleep, and it's not your son keeping you up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so d tell us about the elections. Are we ready? Are you able and saying confident that uh, you'll be able to run these elections well? Absolutely. Um, we have uh, recruited staff. We've trained them. We uh, have organized our logistics. We've tested our systems. And uh, we've been working now on the voters' role. As you know, that we had some challenges pertaining to the voters' role. And, um, and, and, and another problem that we had to deal with or a challenge was uh, uh, the political environment. Uh, but all these matters appear now to have been uh, dealt with. And then we are confident that we will have free and fair elections uh, on the 3rd of August. You mentioned these challenges. I mean, we've seen some killings, actually. I think as many as 13 people now. Uh, has this affected the electoral process itself? Are you still confident that, given the intimidation and, the, and these killings that have happened, that we'll still be able to run free and fair polls and that the result will be a reflection of the will of the people? Of course, any uh, pocket uh, of uh, instability and violence is of a great concern to all of us who are running the elections and would prefer a situation where no one dies um, as a result of our preparations and uh, preparations for political parties to participate in the electoral processes. Uh, but if you take into in, in, in consideration all the matters that we have taken into consideration, all the issues that we have prepared, uh, we are confident that all the issues have been addressed and then we will definitely be able to have free and fair elections. Mm -hmm. Uh, the notion of free and fair election is dependent on quite a number of issues, one of which is obviously the quality of our logistics, making sure that we've got the ballot papers or all other electoral materials, uh, going to the voting station, correct voting stations on time, and making sure that people are able to participate in the process. But the second one is the quality of our electoral staff. We recruited the staff, we have trained them, they know what they're supposed to be doing, and they understand that they've got to run this process with integrity and impartiality. And uh, we are satisfied that uh, all these processes are in place and we will definitely be able to have free and fair elections. Vuani has been a thorny issue. Uh, in the past week, we saw um, traditional leaders uh, sign packs and saying that people should be able to vote. Then we heard people saying that, look, these people voted, um, assigned, but not on our behalf. Are we confident that people will be able to vote freely in Vuani? There are two processes that are taking place in Vuani. Uh, firstly, is the engagement with the community. Our uh, conflict med mediation uh, panels uh, have been working with the communities in that area. Uh, but apart from that, as you may be aware, uh, Minister Van Rooyen has also been working together with uh, the communities and the traditional leadership in that area. And we are hopeful that uh, these processes will be able to uh, create um, uh, or, or yield fruits and create an environment conducive to free and fair elections. But obviously, in a situation where uh, these discussions are not able to yield fr fruits, um, we will depend largely on law enforcement agencies to make sure that uh, we are able to open our voting stations and our personnel uh, is protected and that there is no danger either to our own people or even in terms of the infrastructure that we would establish for the purpose of the elections. So it's, it's, it's a matter that would require uh, our partners and to make sure that uh, 
you know, things uh, go accordingly. But we rely also on the leadership of the political parties. They are the ones who are supposed to be conversing for support in those areas. And hopefully, uh, the work that they've been doing in, in that area would also uh, contribute in terms of the creation of environment conducive to free and fair elections. Okay, you talked about processes as well. and. Uh, very importantly, people have to have faith and trust that you can secure these elections and that there are no uh, dodgy things that happen. This past week, we saw boxes get stolen from uh, a truck in uh, Soweto. Have you had no other incidents, and are the ballot boxes safely delivered to the various centers at this stage? At this stage, uh, all ballot papers have been um, uh, delivered to all the localities. And we are confident that there are not going to be any difficulties and problems uh, related to the ballot paper. The ballot paper in Dobsonville was stolen from one of our trucks. Uh, but, you know, the good thing about our processes is that all the ballot papers have got serial numbers. And it is possible for us to quarantine those numbers once we realize those ballot papers, once we realize that um, something untoward has happened. Uh, in relation to those ballot papers. So that's exactly what we did. So even if um, uh, they are recovered and recovered some of them, uh, we are not going to be using them. We produce, we have already produced uh, uh, new ballot papers using different security measures to make sure that we are able to uh, deliver the uh, elections in those areas that were affected. Uh, uh, sticking with the integrity of the elections, will there be a, a full accounting at the end of the day uh, X number of ballot box, uh, b ballot papers printed, serial numbers 1 to 10. These were used, these were not used, and this is what we should have on stock. And so that there's no chance of anyone trying to fix yeah. the system. <laughs> <laughs> there is no possibility yeah. of anyone interfering with our processes. Uh, like you correctly mm -hmm. say, uh, at the end of voting, there's got to be a reconciliation. The presiding officer, uh, will uh, sit together with uh, the staff in the full uh, presence of the party agents and observers and will start doing the reconciliation. And there is a form that the presiding officer will then uh, sign uh, to indicate the materials that are there having done the reconciliation. And after the presiding officer has done that, uh, the system anticipates that the person who's going to be uh, uh, dealing with accounting is a different person mm -hmm. from the person who was do, helping with vo voting. So the presiding officer has got to uh, hand over mm -hmm. uh, to the counting officer. And again, during that particular process, mm -hmm. there is a process of reconciliation to make sure that information and materials that have been given to the, to the accounting officer, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, that, uh, that information is able uh, to reconcile. And if it does not reconcile, any political party can actually lodge a complaint or an objection in terms of that particular process. No. You've got an objection a process during, count, during voting. Uh, we call it uh, Section 51 objection. Mm -hmm. And then again, uh, during uh, the verification process, when now the word papers are being handed over uh, to the counting officer, uh, in terms of the Municipal Electoral Act, uh, Municipal Electoral mm -hmm. Act uh, we refer to it as Section 59. And then immediately after verification, there is also another process, we call it Section 62, mm -hmm. uh, where during the sorting of the ballot papers, uh, political parties and any person who is at the voting station can lodge a complaint. And then once we are done with that, we you have now what we call Section 65 <laughs> objections. <laughs> so the whole process mm -hmm. uh, has got measures uh, aimed at making sure that a person who wants to lodge a complaint or an objection can lodge a complaint and objection, and either the presiding officer or the counting officer has a responsibility of making sure that they deal with it. Okay. Now, Section 65 objections would then be those that are dealt with by us as the commission. We refer to them as objections material to the outcome of the elections. Okay. So we will look at all those things and then make sure that we resolve them. The legislation says that we must resolve all 665 objections before we announce the results of the election. Okay. So on the day when we announce the results of the elections, you must know that it means we have exhausted all the objections uh, that have been uh, raised by either political parties or party agents or any person 
at, uh, uh, from the voting station, either during counting or during voting itself. All right, okay. This is something we will talk about again during the week, but uh, just, I guess, to prepare our viewers and our voters, on the day, what time do polling stations open, what time do they close, and when will results start to trickle in? Uh, voting will start at 7 o'clock and um, until 7 o'clock in the, in, the, in the evening. But I think it is important for me to indicate that uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, special votes, which are starting tomorrow, mm. um, we start at 8 o'clock and then we finish at 5 o'clock. Okay. And then when will we start to see some results coming in? Well, immediately when counting has uh, uh, commenced, uh, whichever station that uh, finishes to uh, do the counting, um, they will start now capturing that information in the system, and wherever you are, you will be able to find that information. If you've got a smart card, as you know that we've got an app, mm. um, you download that uh, IEC app, you can follow the results station by station. You can actually even be able to compare the captured results as well as, well as uh, the scanned results, because we give you two things so that you can be able to compare information that is captured into the system mm -hmm. uh, with the information that is actually scanned to see as to whether there is anything untoward that has actually happened to the result. All right, Terry, it sounds like you're on top of your game and that uh, uh, all things being equal, that these should be uh, um, fairly safe elections. Absolutely. I am quite confident, and all of us as commissioners and the staff uh, of the IEC, we understand um, that uh, the community out there is anxious about these elections and they want to make sure that uh, the outcome that we're going to be announcing on the day of the election uh, truly reflects the will of the people and we will not betray the trust uh, that our people have bestowed on us as well as the constitution. We will make sure that uh, the results, um, uh, that, that the elections are run with integrity and that um, everybody is comfortable that uh, what we are going to be announcing indeed is the will of the people. All right, Terry Tsilani, Deputy Chair of the IEC, thank you very much uh, for joining us. And I am sure that we will be chatting to you quite a bit in the coming days. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, thank you. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, it's the final lap in the race for votes and seats in this year's municipal elections. We'll be taking a look at this in greater detail. Stay with us. Manifestos. We have taken you on the campaign trails, the rallies and the door-to-door -door campaigns, and we caught the tension on tape. And even the drama when internal battles spilled into the public eye. Our cameras kept on rolling. And now we bring you the race for seats. A record number of 63,654 candidates want your vote. As the numbers trickle in, we'll give you live updates from across the country and from the hotspots. While the police keep a watchful eye, so will Africa. Wherever you are, stay updated. Wherever you are, stay updated. Wherever you are, stay updated. The SABC, the nerve center of South Africa's elections news. From the moment you start your day. My biggest question is how I got myself here on time. Yeah. This is so <laughs> early for a comedian, I've got to be honest. We are there for you. We bring your morning into perspective. As news breaks throughout the morning. It's an investment into the future of the airports company, but also the future of our children, the future of our country, the future of the transport sector. We'll make sure that you get the full story. Give us quality music. Load shedding. Listen, this winter. It's a thing of the past. And you can count on the weather team with expertise. Join us live at 6 a.m. daily. A lot more Africans are getting smartphones. We've got 150 million people using mobile devices in this country. This means internet connectivity is increasing. That results in access to information. 
Some are using social media to share new African narratives through campaigns. The friend says, oh, I'm seeing this thing on Facebook. Oh, where is it happening? At Yege Stadium, everybody goes there. On Network, we tell you how Africans are staying connected. We also have new gadgets, games, and social media news. That's Network with Ms. Pumelele Zondi. Every Sunday at 19.30 Central African Time, Right, now this election season will be one of many firsts for the country and the climate is quite different since the last time we went to the polls. Joining us now in the studio, we have uh, Ranesh, uh, Michael and uh, uh, Kandiwe. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Yeah. Ranesh uh, Jawaraj, um, I know I got that wrong. I, it was going to happen. You're almost there. It's <laughs> Ranesh Dharaj. Dharaj, there we go. Michael O'Donovan. Not something. And uh, Prof <laughs> Kandiwe Kondlo, thank you very much thank for joining us and welcome. Thank you. All right, let's jump straight into it. And the one thing that's new, but significantly so, is the emergence of the economic freedom fighters. How much of a change in the dynamics of the politics will they bring to these local government elections? Let's start with you. I think first of all, Peter, I think the EFF has just injected a new kind of life, a new kind of energy into the kind of politics that we are seeing in South Africa. Obviously, they weren't around in 2011. They emerged in 2013, participated in the 2014 provincial and general elections. But very exciting times. All of us, when we're at home, we watch what's happening in the National Assembly, what's happening in the provincial legislatures. My, my big question is what's going to happen in those local municipalities, in those local councils? Is the EFF going to do the same? same kind of things they are doing in the National Assembly and the provincial legislatures. I think, in a way, it's entertaining politics, but, you know, obviously they're going to inject that new energy, you know, when those councils finally sit in 14 or 15 days' time. Your thoughts, initial thoughts, Michael? Initial thoughts is that the, we're moving into an era where coalition politics are going to loom quite large. And I suspect the EFF are eyeing that, uh, that ground, along with a number of other parties. But they're also a very difficult group to to create a coalition with. Mm. And we're going to have to wait to see how this plays out. Mm. I mean, are they significant enough? They've got this presence in Parliament, but they got this literally after five minutes of being in the game, as it were. Now mm. they've had quite a bit of time. You look at their rallies, and they seem to have numbers on the ground. Could they actually even win municipalities? Absolutely not. Uh, let's start with you. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, I think they will win some local municipalities, mm. uh, but I doubt if they will win any of the, of the three metros. Mm. Uh, but let's wait and see. But what the EFF is bringing, which, which was not there, mm. I would say it's number one, the, the radicalization mm. of South African politics. Mm especially their emphasis on the land question, the unresolved land question in South Africa. That is number one. And secondly, they have the advantage of age. You're talking about young people, you see, uh, who have the energy and who still have the time to see through some of the ideals they are standing for. All right. Uh, look, the EFF will continue in this conversation going forward, but I, I guess one of the themes that have been coming through and, and these polls, whether you want to believe them or not, have created this doubt now that this once mighty ANC perhaps might be going through a period where they're doubting themselves mm. and the people are doubting that they may get below that 50% mark in some of these major areas. What's your feelings generally? It's not with you, Michael, this time. Well, you've got to take the big picture here. You've got one trend in urban and big cities. Uh, ANC is, is going to lose that absolute majority it holds in several places, possibly even including Rustenburg um, um, and a couple of other municipalities. So that... Um, that trend is contrasted with what's going to happen in the rural areas, particularly in KwaZulu-Natal, where the ANC will probably more than make up its losses. Mm. So we're probably ending up in a situation where um, the three big parties all declare victory after the election. Mm. Mm. Why has this happened? 
Um, I think, you know, you know, like we pointed out earlier, South African politics is in a great state of flux at present. Uh, like uh, Prof also touched on the youth vote, you know, younger voters are, you know, re-energized about the EFF. They're bringing this new excitement into our kind of politics. I just go back, uh, just going back to the question of why the EFF is so important. Obviously, the metros, you know, this whole issue of the kingmaker, the so-called kingmaker in the metros. The ANC probably, according to those Ipsos polls, will probably drop below the 50% uh, 50, 50 plus one majority level. So obviously they will look for a partner and the EFF could possibly be that kingmaker. And especially in the metros, you've got to consider the issue of the urban middle classes. Uh, the ANC, we can say since 1994, has been the legitimate creator of those middle classes, you know, with the policies such as affirmative action, those kind of things. So the ANC is going to try and retain the status quo, fight for the poor voters, fight for the middle class. The DA is going to try very, very hard to fry, uh, fight for the middle classes especially. But I think where the EFF comes in is that the EFF is targeting the ANC support base, especially in the townships, especially in the informal settlements. Uh, settlements. And, 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 and I think that's why the, the ANC is, um, well, kind of feeling vulnerable, especially in those townships. Can do, do you think that the ANC and the EFF should have seen, I mean, the um, DA should have seen this EFF emergence coming through um, because the trends were there for some time, particularly for the ANC going this way, the DA perhaps steady growth, mm. but this new kid on the block kind of disrupted things a little bit. Could they have predicted this might happen? Look, I think the ANC was very unstrategic in its decision to expel Julius Malema. Mm. Very unstrategic. And, and, and in fact, some of the analysts, we actually did say so. That is not a wise move by the ANC to, to, to expel Mr. Malema because clearly, even before he started the EFF, he had a lot of support within the Youth League. He's a very charismatic fellow and he can speak very well. So that's why you can see he's able to pull the crowds. And besides that, the FF has sort of developed over the time an ideology, a radical ideology, which is pro-poor, centered on the land question. And that is appealing because uh, many of the people, I must say, some people are actually tired of the ANC promises. Uh, many of the promises that get regurgitated even today, it's a lot of things we've heard before. So the new kid on the block is saying, look, we can do we things clean differently. Yes. All right, we'll explore that and we'll explore some of these regional parties that are strong in certain areas but n nowhere else. But we'll explore that after this. We'll take a quick break and the conversation will continue when we return. Stay with us. Innovators all over Africa are using technology to solve the continent's problems. We looked at all the different startup accelerators and Hack Josie was born. And governments are finding new ways to improve the lives of citizens. We anticipate it will be in a position to handle a capacity of 20,000 logs per second. On Network, we tell you about Africa's technology and social media scene. That's Network with Ms. Pomela Lezondi every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Central African Time. the first democratic vote. In 1994, we were there. To usher in democracy and bring about a new South Africa. Over the years, blow by blow coverage of the election. And now, we'll be bringing you the numbers as they come in on your TV, computer, and even on your phone. Well, think about it as your personal guide to the elections. Get to know why your municipality is hotly contested. Wherever you are, stay updated. The SABC, the nerve center of South Africa's elections news. Your past should not determine your destiny if you make informed choices about your future. I decided, I made a choice to leave the drugs, stop selling drugs, 
and going back to school. Upilong and Lee, she's a chef who discovered his talent from doing cooking chores. When you look at the church, there was um, chores that you have to do, um, and mine, mine was cooking. Our own chef made an excellent presentation when his recipe was chosen for MasterChef. I've been to more than 10 countries, um, and there was always someone paying for my plane ticket, someone see the potential in me. For uplifting stories, join Pulem Mulebati every Friday at 17.30. Hello and welcome back to tonight's episode of Battlegrounds. And it's the turn, um, the run up to the elections. Uh, we've brought you uh, many multiple debates from various uh, municipalities. And tonight, on the eve of the special votes, the stakes are high and the polls draw nearer. Our panel of analysts are uh, still with us. And uh, let's carry on with this conversation. And uh, the metros, of course, everybody's intrigued to see just how they're going to fall. And um, the polls have come through. Um, you decide which one you want to believe, which one is serious, which one is it. But it does seem that there are some metros where it's quite close or maybe even too close to call. Let's start in Nelson Mandela Bay. Your thoughts about the shifts that have taken place there and a possible outcome, can you? Well, I must say uh, uh, really that I I'm actually worried about the ANC in Nelson Mandela Metro. Mm. Very worried. And, and, and let's look how the undecided uh, vote, which has been projected in, in, in the polls, mm -hmm. where, which side is it, is it going to shift? Mm -hmm. But I must say I'm very worried about the ANC in Metro. If, if the ANC wins Met, uh, Nelson Mandela Metro, the majority is going to, to be so constrained to make any, 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 any meaningful policy implementation mm -hmm as projected by the ANC in its election manifesto. The majority is going to be very constrained. I'm not that worried about the ANC in, in, in Tswane, I don't know, because I still think uh, they will win there, even though, again, there's going to be a reduction in the majority they are going to have. Yes. And Johannesburg is safe, in your view? I think Johannesburg is actually safe. Okay. Your thoughts? Um, I think, first of all, just to go back to the Ipsos polls, like uh, the professor mentioned, I think we've got to be very worried about the, the uh, percentage of undecided voters. And, you know, obviously there is a margin of error. We've got to appreciate that. But remember, these are surveys. These are polls. That undecided, uh, you know, uh, number needs to be considered, especially when it comes to a swing vote, because they could actually decide the election. <coughs> but I think what the DA is doing very, very well in Nelson Mandela Bay Metro is that they they're very visible on the ground. Their leaders are very uh, visible on the ground. The ANC, you know, the, 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 uh, their mayor, Dr. Danny Jordan, he is visible, but not as visible as before. Last year, you would see that they lost Ward 30 in Nelson Mandela Bay Metro, and, and, and a year before, they lost another ward. And, and, and then you ask all those questions, why? Even the uh, ANC spokesperson said, we were complacent. We need to be on the ground. We need to be with the people. Uh, as far as Swan and Johannesburg, I think the ANC will win but the majority will be dented. Mm -hmm. yeah. Michael, the, the disaffected youth, a lot of them are going to be able to vote this time around. And if they show up, will they be the ones that decide which way it goes? I... You can basically assume that they're not going to show up. <laughs> they're not going to show up <laughs> in the numbers. Um, and this is really where the EFF is going to battle. Mm. Each power base, is a broad, it's a, they've got a broad base of power. But it relies heavily on people that are marginalized. Marginalized not only mm -hmm. from national politics, but also from the ANC mm -hmm. uh, or from Kasatu. And the one, you need to view the, 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 the voting race as a three-way race between voting for your normal party or um, the party you've always vote, voted for, not voting, mm -hmm. and voting for an opposition party. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I think what's going to happen is that the a lot more people are simply going to abstain. Mm -hmm. And the greater that abstention, the less the impact uh, parties like the EFF will make. And 
Um, so, but before, isn't an abstention someone who perhaps is disillusioned with the ruling party rather than someone who's excited about a new party? Um, I think we've also got to consider that local elections no, don't necessarily attract a very large voter turnout. Mm -hmm. The 2011 local elections was the highest ever in this country at 58%. Previously we had 48%, 47%. The IEC just last week, they said they've got 26.3 million people registered. They're aiming for 17 million people to actually turn out on voting day. That's around 65%. Will they get that 65%? I highly doubt it. Mm. I would project around 55, around 52 to 55. Mm. Um, I've spoke to um, Melissa Gigaba this morning, uh, head of research for the ANC's election process, and he, he raised a point where he said, look, um, people are not complaining about the quantity of the uh, service delivery. They're now worried about the quality. So he's saying that, look, people were excited before about getting lights, about getting water. This time around, they're saying, we want the lights on all the time. Mm. We want running water to happen all the time. And that perhaps that, that, that when people complain about service delivery, they're complaining more about the quality of it rather than the quantity. When you get into a voting booth and you figure that out, will that change your mind on the voting day? Well, well, I think the most important thing, what that is showing is that, look, you cannot patronize people, patronize by saying so many millions have electricity, when that electricity is so intermittent. Mm. They get it one day, they don't get it the other day, they get it one week, then for two weeks it is off. You can't patronize people in that way. And South Africans are actually waking up to that, you see to say, if you say you're delivering, then deliver the full package and do it consistently. Mm. And, and I actually think the way how this, the delivery of electricity, water, and, and other basic services is, 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 is upsetting quite a number of people. Mm. And it could actually affect how they think, how they evaluate who to vote for independently. When people do independent evaluations of who should I vote for, somebody will deliver services consistently in my area, then people are going to change minds. That is a very important factor. Okay. Yeah. If, if there's this shift in these uh, amounts uh, and, and, and uh, balance of powers in these metros, how is that going to change the way um, the metros are run and also, I guess, us as um, uh, citizens mm -hmm. are affected by this new dynamic? You know, Peter, you know, the, the, the narrative around these elections are around the metros. You know, obviously Johannesburg, Tswane, Ekuruleni, Nelson, uh, Nelson Mandela Bay Metro. But I think what people are not questioning is how stable are those coalitions going to be post-August the 3rd? You know, the EFF is very disruptive by its very nature. We've seen the National Assembly, the provincial legislatures. Will the EFF, uh, EFF actually work with those other parties in a constructive manner? Or will they do what they're doing in the National Assembly? You know, that's a very watched space, you know, to, 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 to actually monitor. But I think, uh, you know, those coalitions, they, uh, you know, we have to question how durable, are, uh, you know, they are going to be once those councils actually sit, uh, who's going to be the mayor, who's going to be the municipal municipal manager, who's going to be the speaker, the deputy speaker. So those political horse trading things are going to happen. Mm. Yeah. We're moving from a situation where, by and large, the ANC typically had two-thirds majority uh, in most municipalities um, three, four elections ago. Mm. Now they've moved out of a situation where they may or may not, not get 50% in many of the major cities. And I think that is a universal good for everybody involved. Yeah. The level of vigilance, the level of oversight um, becomes so heightened because what happens then is that if you're sitting on 50 percent and you, you lose a by-election, mm. you've lost it, that municipality. Mm. So you have to deliver, you have to appease a wider um, set of uh, a wider electorate. So I really see this as a, as a universal good. Okay, we'll continue to explore all of this and more uh, after the break. We'll take a quick one and the conversation will continue. Stay with us.
Good afternoon, you're with the news at one. Welcome to Lunchtime News Amplified. The selection of political parties by means of a lucky draw has been a common practice for the past 22 years. We take an in-depth look at top stories of the day and live crossings to our journalists on the scene. First time in our nation's history that a woman will be a major party's nominee. Business news, sports update and weather report. Hello and welcome to News Live. I'm Natasha Thorpe. Good to have you with us. For all things news, tune in to Midday Report, weekdays at 12 noon, only on the SABC News Channel. Certain choices in life lead us not to our destination. Prostitution will not. Everything uh, that I used to do then, it was something that I never thought of, I never dreamed of. One bad choice in life led her to another. Most of my clients, they used to ask me a question, what am I doing in that industry? Because it does not suit me at all. Her demons haunted her until she changed her life. I used to pray that, Lord, if you can deliver me from these drugs, I promise you that I will serve you for the rest of my life. She has since found peace and is serving her community. We'll try by all means to spend time with all of our kids. Join your host, Bulen Mulebati, every Friday at 17.30. David brought back black and white photography to life through the Zanzibar exhibition. I'm a fanatic for tones. You know, I love the kind of tones and gradients and greys and, you know, I just, it, it never bores me. We're representing South Africa. I mean, we're flying the flag there, so uh, it, it's a beautiful thing for us. The dance floor is always lit when DJ Black Coffee hits the decks. He was praised for his appearance at this year's Coachella Music Festival in California. And he recently bagged the International Achievement Award at the 2016 Summers. Catch trends for that one-hour weekly dose of arts and entertainment news every Saturday from 12 to 1. Welcome back. Now, filling up stadiums and going door to door. The race to the polls has been heating up as the ballots have been drawing closer and closer. Political parties are contesting in this year's elections left no stone unturned, it seems, in their race for votes. Pundits have been watching some of the country's key metro areas as well as uh, other areas in other parts of the country, particularly the uh, smaller municipalities. And my guests are still with us. Uh, a lot to unpack, but I think we've looked at the metros mm. quite a bit but let, let's look at the smaller areas the regional areas EFF is in uh, Limpopo this is the home of Julius Malema but will this translate into votes and then we've got areas like Bushbuck Ridge mm. where the Bushbuck mm. Ridge uh, Residents Association these smaller parties that are have got a regional uh, strength mm. uh, and nowhere else what role are they going to play uh, come post August 3 I think, Peter, just remember these are local government elections. It is about ward votes. It is about PR votes. Don't discount the smaller players in these elections. I'll give you a very good example. There is a party called the Kiruchamienska Parte. They won the Prince Albert local municipality back in 2011. It's a seven-seat council, very small. They took on the ANC. They took on the DA. The ANC won two seats. The DA won two seats. The Kiruchamienska Parte won three seats. They got control of the council. Even further, they went into a coalition with the ANC to get control of the district council in that region. So yes, smaller parties will make a difference. And I think where the smaller parties will make a major difference, you know, we're talking about coalitions. If the council's very small, these guys will be the kingmakers because obviously the DA wants to attract them, offer them a post of speaker or municipal manager or even a mayor's post like we've seen uh, was offered to PAC in the Western Cape and to COPE in a couple of Northern Cape uh, municipalities. So these smaller players like the Bushbuck Ridge Residents Association uh, and the even ECOSA to a certain degree because ECOSA won a council in 2011. So these ones, watch them very closely. Kingmaker status, you know, will be afforded to them. 
And I suppose Kingmaker's status is something that's going to be quite important this time around if, again, mm. these polls are to be believed. I think that's the... Um that's where all, where all eyes will be after the election. Mm. But I think there's another advantage to these small parties that the electorate at large and the political parties in general really treat local government elections as a proxy for the national election. Mm. And local issues really have fallen off the radar. Yeah. Uh, nobody's going out campaigning about what's happening in my particular area. Absolutely. And this is where these smaller parties can make mm. a, a difference by mm. focusing on uh, on these small towns mm, okay. and become a kingmaker. Mm. So, Kendi, we've got a lot of independent candidates this time around. I mean, what can you do as a single voice other than get a salary? Yes, it's interesting, actually, this phenomenon of, of independence mm. because I also observed it in the 2011 elections. Mm. Uh, and a very interesting case uh, uh, in, in, in Alwal North, you see, I, th I think uh, Professor Ndekiana wrote about it in one journal. Yes where we have a, a gentleman who actually was expelled by the ANC, ran as an independent, and actually managed to secure quite a, a large number of votes. Mm. So it's interesting, but on the overall, if you look at 2011, the performance of independents was not that great. Very few of them actually managed to get seats. It will be interesting mm. to see what's, what's going to happen with independents in the coming local government election 2016. It's interesting also mm. because in case that end, some of these independents have actually a very, should I say, the ANC has a hostile mm. regard of some of mm. these independents, actually distancing them. From, so let's from say the there's a council yeah. with 61 <laughs> seats, an independent gets one. What can you do in that council? Peter, again, going back to the King Waker position, mm. here's a very good example of uh, a council in Cape Agullis. The, the ANC won four seats, the DA won four seats, and the single seat that an independent held was given to the ANC. So the ANC won that council mm. just by luring that independent towards its side. So the independents, whether you're a small party, whether you're a ratepayers association, that one seat, when that council sits, and especially in smaller councils, will make a huge difference. All right. You know what? Let's get a sense, perhaps, of uh, what uh, some of our uh, viewers are saying and thinking. They've been uh, sending their tweets. Let's take a look at those tweets now. Let's just uh, get a sample. Uh, so uh, this first one has come through. Uh, it says, uh, Battlegrounds 2016. Um, tough question. I watched all three rallies. EFF was more resonating with lots of people. I think uh, Mother Party must apologize. That's uh, Mildred uh, Pierre. <laughs> Uh, Puti says that I think the NC will still be the majority party in most municipalities in 2016, but that will increase over time. Uh, yeah, no party performed well. ANC was short of ideas. DA is using propaganda, and I, ha I hardly saw F EFF adverts, hardly saw any EFT adverts on TV. Okay, so um, there was a different tone and language that certainly came through these elections. And in fact, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a very robust President Jacob Zuma. And some people are saying he's, he's, he might have even crossed the line a few times. Uh, your thoughts about the tone and the language of, of the campaigning? I actually felt the tone and the language of this particular uh, local government election was not as personal. And, and as adversarial as we as we saw just mm. before the 2011 mm. uh, local government elections, where people were actually attacking each other personally mm. and ver in very bad ways. Yes. The president's involvement in this election has been quite interesting. Uh, very, should I say, very proactive and very firm indeed in defending the ANC and attacking the opposition, especially the, the Democratic Alliance. Mm. Yes. And I actually feel that probably he had to do that because, you see, part of his personal circumstances have actually contributed to the constricted political position the ANC is in. Mm -hmm. I say that with due respect. Mm -hmm. All right. So are you saying that um, he, he had to change the narrative by going out there because had he not... Uh, some of these stories that have been floating around in the courts and so on and so forth might have had an, a negative effect on, on brand ANC. Is that what we're saying? I see it a little bit different now. I see what the ANC are attempting to do is to sh shift the narrative away from local issues towards the big proxy national election issue mm -hmm. and drawing, up, drawing on the authority mm -hmm. of, the, of the president. Mm -hmm. 
Because um, one of the things that is clearly happening is that the focus is not on local issues. Mm. It's back mm. towards the broad issues. Mm. Are they even talking about issues? Are they, are they actually even saying, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it? Or is it that, you know, this party is uh, not for white people, this party is not for no. black people? Uh, have they been talking about issues? See, that's the problem. And, 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 you know, just to go back to what Prof, uh, uh, Prof was saying earlier, you know, in 2011, there were lots of personal attacks. You know, Julius Malema was still part of the ANC Youth League fold. We had lots of allegations against Lindiwe Mazibuko being uh, a tea girl, the garden boy, <laughs> Helen Zilla, yes. or, you know, on the attack, on the prowl. You know, those kind of rhetoric that, 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 that we saw in 2011. I think in uh, 2016, you know, this whole issue of the Mandela name, and, 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 and I still contend that the ANC should not have reacted in the way that they did. They, they, they were very reactive to the way the DA framed the story. Uh, the ANC could have reacted by saying that, you know, you guys always say this is no longer the ANC of Tambo, the ANC of Lutuli. And then you can reframe whatever the DA is saying, saying, look at the DA. They're taking inspiration from our leaders. Same with Mandela. But Mandela is a global icon. So any political party, in, in, in my opinion, can actually stake claim to Mandela's name because he's not only available and belongs to the ANC. But again, going back to what, you know, the, 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 the Tambo and the Lutuli argument, you know, the ANC can easily say, these guys, they're inspired by our leaders, so they give us respect mm. in that sense. So it, it, we're talking about ownership of an icon. Yeah. But again, you know, at the end of the day, if someone wants to open a tap and find water in there, does it matter? what these arguments are about when really the bread and butter issues are what are most important. You can take it a bit further in the mm. sense of what's happened over the last 20 years that every year our rates, taxes, service charges have increased faster than inflation. The economy is at a stage where we are feeling, the households are feeling the pinch. But none of the debate is about whether or not the services provided are efficient, effective and and particularly are cost effective. And hopefully over time we will move to a situation where there is some kind of a reflection of the simple economics of whether or not it's worth spending 3,000 million rand a year on councillors. So given all this language that's playing out then, do you think that it's affected people or they've already kind of decided which way they're going to go? And then all this drama that's been playing out in the last couple of weeks or so is not going to sway them. Look, it's, 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 it's very difficult to say, but one wish, my wish is that really South Africans can get to a point where they do independent evaluation of the system at local government level and then decide which party to vote for. Because all these parties, they are so good in making huge promises but they make these promises of delivery, of creating employment. Look at the, at the state of the economy in the country. The country's economy is going through a period of stress. And if government is not careful, by 2018, government is going to have to retrench. Okay. I'm talking about the public sector, you see. All right. We'll chat a little bit more about that, yeah. the economy or whatever. But I, I, some, some national issues can play down to local issues and vice mm. versa. But we'll take a look at that after this quick break. Yeah, I mean... you the elections manifestos we have taken you on the campaign trails the rallies and the door-to-door -door campaigns and we caught the tension on tape and even the drama when internal battles spilled into the public eye our cameras kept on rolling and now we bring you the race for seats a record number of 63,654 candidates want your vote as the numbers trickle in, we'll give you live updates from across the country and from the hotspots. While the police keep a watchful eye, so will Africa. Wherever you are, stay updated. Wherever you are, stay updated. Wherever you are, stay updated. The SABC, 
the nerve center of South Africa's elections news. We are one of the 22 high burden countries and out of that we are number six. Um, following countries like India, China and uh, with huge population. Cough, night sweats, weight loss and fever. Mm -hmm. And cough being the most important of those. So, uh, and especially if the cough is lasts for more than three weeks, then you really have to uh, worry and get tested for TB. The motivation is to affect behavior, behavior change particularly with people who cough and who may be carrying the bacterium. So encouraging people to use the elbow. For more on health, join your host Dr. Selo Mudaong every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. Usiswe Jamsana, SABC News, Alice. We bring the news back home. We keep the nation fully informed. Right, a very warm welcome back. We're starting to get uh, some concluding thoughts, I think, because uh, you've heard a lot from your uh, political parties trying to convince you to vote for them. And then next Wednesday, you're going to be all on your own in that voting booth, and you're going to have to decide uh, your future based on the candidates that are before you. So I'm going to ask you in conclusions, um, when this poor voter has to go and sit stand in that uh, voting booth what do they need to consider what what are the issues you think that they've they've they have to process to come to the right choice for them Peter I still contend that you know no matter what you and I say I still think the ANC has a captive constituency in the in, in, in South Africa's politics and the kind of politics that we see um, identity politics whether you and I like it or not still exists in, 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 in the South African voters mind but I think the close issue to watch is the the you know the way the middle classes are going to vote especially in those metros Johannesburg Ekuruleni, Tswane and Nelson Mandela Bay Metro um, I would like to see our democracy mature more where to a level where people will want to vote on issues okay. and not on party images. All right, mm. there we go. I think it'd be very interesting to watch what the black middle class does in particular in the sense of this is a group of people that could possibly attribute their success mm. to the ANC. Mm. But the concerns at local government level are whether the lights go on, stay on, whether electricity is too expensive, what's happening to the rates and taxes. So these guys are caught in the middle here mm. as to how do we solve this dilemma that you pose okay. us? Black middle class based on the thought that you think the youth are not going to show up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the most important thing really, we want a local government sphere that works and that can deliver to all our needs. All right, you know what, I'm going to leave it there. Professor Kandiwa Kondlo, thank you very much indeed. Michael O'Donovan, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and Ranesh, thank you. <laughs> I'm not going to try. <laughs> yeah, and that uh, brings us to the end of tonight's show and our series, uh, Battlegrounds. I'd like to thank uh, our analysts uh, who've joined us. But before we go, the IEC has developed an easy-to-use app for all things municipal elections uh, and, of course, uh, SABC news that digital took a closer look from all of us here though good night and don't forget to go and vote on wednesday bye bye
The Independent Electoral Commission has an app available for iOS and Android for free download on both app stores. Using your South African ID number, the app is able to tell you where you are registered to vote for the August 3rd elections. The menu options on the mobile application also make it possible for one to gain information on nominated candidates as well as councillors from their area. Information is provided on how the voting process will be for an individual in the municipal election. The profile menu in the application gives insight as to where your voting station is located together with a map to lead you to the voting station. The integration of this application not only allows for information on voter info, but also gives you the latest news relating to the elections coming from the IEC. The electoral info section of the app answers all frequently asked questions about the elections and also gives you the do's and don'ts when voting. Innovators all over Africa are using technology to solve the continent's problems. We looked at all the different startup accel accelerators and Hack Josie was born. And governments are finding new ways to improve the lives of citizens. We anticipate it will be